raises a hand. Another cool anthem called We Believe. Oh, 
Open up the heavens, we want to see you. Open up the floodgates, a mighty river. like a cloud, you're standing with us now, Lord, unveil our eyes, you're the reason we're here, you're the reason we're singing, open up the heavens, we want to see you, open up the floodgates, a mighty river flowing from your heart. Open up. Open up the heavens. We wanna see you. Open up the floodgates. A mighty river flowing from your heart, filling every part of our veins. Let's sing. Show us your glory. Show us. Show us your glory. Show us. Show us your power, show us, show us your glory, Lord. Let that be your prayer. Show us, show us your glory, show us, show us your power, show us, show us your glory, Lord. A mighty river flowing from your heart, filling every part of our praise. Open up the heavens, we want to see you. Open up the floodgates, a mighty river flowing from your heart, filling every part of our praise. Flowing from your heart. Hallelujah. Team, you may be seated. We want to thank you for being here last Sunday and staying for our mission banquet. We had like 210 people we served, and we raised like $5,265 last week. Wow. We were overwhelmed by your attendance and also by your generosity. The only sad point for me today is I did not get one roll that Sarah from me. Not one. And from what I hear, they were fantastic. A few people did admit to eating too. So I have forgiven you in my heart, not my head. <laughs> what an awesome day. And so I, I believe last Sunday I may have said, you know, Oftentimes, people will tell you that uh, when you have a mountaintop experience, there's a valley that often comes afterwards. And so I went home from the mission banquet, and I was exhausted, and I just laid down in bed for a few minutes. And I said, well, that was a mountaintop experience. I suppose the valley's next. And the Lord says, says who? Where do you find that in the Bible? I said, well, just a minute, Lord. I mean, you know it better than I do. What about Moses? What about Moses? Hey, he was up in a mountain, and he got the Ten Commandments to come down. The people were sinning. You know, what about, well, he went back up the mountain, didn't he? Ah, yeah, he did. So I decided to stay on the mountain this week. It's been fun up there, all right? So don't think you have to go in the valley after you've had one of those mountaintop experiences. Let's just stay up there as long as we can and enjoy the ride. So praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. We have a little video that we're going to show you this morning. Uh, there have been a, a lot of criticism about us saying our thoughts and prayers are with you uh, from those who don't believe as we do. Uh, we had the disaster in, in Florida with the shooting, and 
we sent out our thoughts and prayers, and we were ridiculed for sending out what good are thoughts and prayers. Well, I'll tell you, as someone who's grieved, lost, your thoughts and prayers meant the world to me. I felt those prayers. I knew God was with me. And that's what we're saying. Our thoughts and prayers are with those who have experienced such great loss. They need thoughts and they need prayers during this time. And we're not going to let those out there who don't believe in God and don't believe in Jesus, don't believe in thoughts and prayers, to keep us from praying and sending our thoughts and prayers. And so there's a wonderful little video that was put together by a youth group that was sent to me by David Williams. I'd like to show you that this morning just to remind you to stand firm in prayer. Lord God Almighty, we welcome thoughts and prayers of people, thoughts and prayers of one another. We thank you for this video and for these young people who are standing firm in the face of opposition. Today I want to pray for our teachers here. I lift them up to you and I pray as they pray over their classroom that you provide them with protection and that they see in your teachers the light of the world shining through them. I pray for our students as they go to school that they will gain wisdom, that they will be encircled by friends who help them to stand firm in their faith and in their life of prayer. I want to pray today, Father, for our firefighters, our police officers, for, for our EMTs, for those who are going out regularly to help people who are in need. Lord, they see things we would never want to see, but there are days when a life is saved and a life is spared and it lifts up their spirits. And so we thank you for them today and pray your protection upon them and the crews that are out there. I watched the fire being fired, fought this week, Father, in our own neighborhood as a garage went up in flames, as the vehicle in the, gra in the garage exploded. I watched those firefighters there to put that fire out and help that family in need. I thank you for the protection that you provided. I lift up today our doctors and our nurses, and I thank you for the care that they provide as they help to heal and pray over those who come to them in their time of need. I want to pray today for those who drive a lot this week, for those who are on the road, for those who are in trucks, for those who are going up and down 81. I lift them up in prayer and pray your holy angels surround them from the beginning to the end and when they get back, Lord, keep them safe. I pray today for our fathers, that when, when our children look at their fathers, they see a shining example for Jesus Christ. Give us strength, Father. I pray for our mothers as, as they raise their children. 
That is, they look at, as the children look at their mothers, they see a shining example for Jesus Christ. I pray for each member here. I thank you for the giftedness that you've given them, for the voices they have that lift up the name of Jesus Christ. You are worthy. You're worthy. And we pray today in the name of Jesus and always. Amen. I have to uh, confess, I was one of those people that had two roles, maybe two and a half. So, <laughs> let's see how far forgiveness goes. <laughs> uh, I had the wonderful opportunity last week to go with some of my youth to Zeal Night of Worship uh, in Harrisburg at Crosslinks Baptist Church. And it was an amazing night full of worship and prayer time to see five, six, seven young people get together and pray over the nation, over their schools, uh, over each other. And it was amazing and a powerful thing. And prayer is alive and well in this country. And we need to continue to use it and teach our young people the power of it. So as uh, uh, the ushers come forward for this morning's offering, let me lead you in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, you are great. You are amazing. You are wonderful. You are the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and we love you. And we thank you for every blessing you've put in our life, Lord, no matter how small, we thank you for that. As we prepare to give back a little bit of what you've given us, Lord, we ask that you would take this to further the gospel, Lord, to further your hope and your love for a nation that so desperately wants to hear this message, Lord. Use it to further that message. I thank you for every person in this sanctuary, every person in this community that praises and loves you with their life and their actions. I ask all this in your holy, precious name. Amen. How many of you have seen the movie I Can Only Imagine? Don't go unless you want your life to be changed forever. Wow, what an awesome, powerful movie. I don't get to the movies often. One of the best movies I have ever seen. I saw tears everywhere, and it was powerfully done. I, I don't normally recommend movies, but that's, this is one you want to see. So... Um, I can only imagine. It's the story behind the song. What brought that song about? Extremely powerful. So, I'd like to invite our children up now for our children's story this morning before we send you down to Children's Church. And happy birthday, Kinsley. How old are you today? Nine. One more year in single digits next but year. I'm going to be my sister's birthday. I'm going to be this how old on my, my second birthday. Four. You're going to be four tomorrow? Yeah, well, I got to give you two a cookie if you've got birthdays. Cookie. Here's a cookie. cookie. You all get a cookie in the end. They'll get two. Okay. Maybe I'll get, I'll get the rest. Mm. Okay. I'll angle a little bit here. Today, I want to tell you the story about the big bad snowman and the three little guinea pigs. Have you ever heard that story before? No. You've never heard that story before. I have heard about Woody and Bear story. I read that every day. You read it every day? I read it every day. All right. Well, this story is about the big bad snowman 
and the three little guinea pigs. And the three little guinea pigs all decided to build a house. And the first little guinea pig decided to build his house out of candy. So who would like to build me a house out of this candy? Come on up here, Henry. Build me a nice tall house out of that candy. Doing good, doing good. How many of you would like to have a house built out of candy? How long do you think it would last? Not very long. Not very long, huh? Would you invite your friends over to your house? Here, have a bite out of my room. You're going to eat all the candy yourself? Yeah. Big bad snowman's going to get you. <laughs> he looks tough, doesn't he? No. Okay, Henry, good job. So, the first little guinea pig built his house out of candy. And along came the big bad snowman. And the big bad snowman said, I'm going to roll and roll and roll your house over. And oh. Destroyed his house. I want you to read that. A house of candy doesn't last, does it? No. So, the next little guinea pig decided to build his house. Elizabeth, you want to build me a house out of cookie? Come on up here. The next guinea pig decided to build his house out of cookie. How would you like your house to be made of chocolate chip cookie? Yeah. Would that be good? Would you invite your friends over? No. Oh, you guys, come on. An ice cream, that would last a day. I would to eat that forever. Well, what if I decided to take all these cookies home for myself? And I don't give you one, huh? Huh? Would that be fair? Would that be nice? It won't be nice at all, all right? Can I come over to your house and help eat your house of cookies? No. Well, I ask. Good job, Elizabeth. So, the second guinea pig made its house out of, what are you going to do, eat that, Henry? Yeah. In front of everybody? I think. <laughs> Henry. <laughs> Give me three laps around the church, all right? <laughs> the big bad snowman came along and he said, I'm going to roll and roll and roll your house over. And, oh, he rolled over the Yay! cookie house and the cookie house fell over. So the third, I'll, I'll make sure you all get a cookie, okay? okay? But first of all, we have to have the third little guinea pig. And the third little guinea pig is going to make his house out of brick. brick. Uh. <laughs> you like that? And along came the big bad snowman. And the big bad snowman said, I'm going to roll and roll and roll your house over. What's happening? What's happening? It's not even moving. Big bad snowman went home. Isn't it supposed to melt by now? It's not a real snowman. It's a big bad snowman. How dare I say that? It's a beanie baby. All right? So, yes, Henry. So, this brick represents our foundation in life. Grab it on my head. Uh, no. <laughs> because this is not a beanie baby brick, all right? That's a real brick. And what we teach you in children's church and vacation Bible school and what we teach you in our homes is that Jesus is the cornerstone of our life. And if we don't want the big bad snowman, in this case, we don't want the devil just blowing over our foundation, then we need Jesus in our life. Because the Bible says, greater is he that is in me. Say that. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. All right. And so he runs into us with Jesus in our life and he can't blow us over. He can't roll us. 
over. Wee. So we want you to have a good foundation. And that's why we teach you the truth wow. about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. So I'm going to pour some cookies out here. Go ahead and take a cookie with you as you go to Children's Church. Give me those. And Kinsley, have a wonderful birthday. I go by. <laughs> you got another one, Henry? All right. You're going to enjoy the materials out of the two guinea pigs that made bad houses. Okay. I am so blessed. Hi, Nora. What's got a cow? It looks like a cow. You going to stay up here with Pastor Fred this morning? <laughs> Say, this is good stuff, huh? I got a whole table of cookies. We'll just stay here all day long. Can you believe my son ate two rolls last Sunday? Can you believe that? Your dad didn't get any. <laughs> I wasn't done. <laughs> All right, I have a little video here by the skit guys to introduce how important it is to make sure the voice you're listening to is the voice of God. That's what we're going to look at today. How do I know if I'm listening to the voice of God, the voice of the devil, or my own little voice? So, fire away, Tammy. Awkward invitation number 881, how not to invite someone to church. Hey, what are you doing? Oh, burying your cat, Mr. Bootsy. I loved Mr. Bootsy. I guess you love Mr. Bootsy too, huh? Because he's your cat. Well, was your cat. Hey, I got an idea. Why don't you come to church with me? Because all cats go to heaven, and if you go to church with me, you can find out what happened to Mr. Bootsy. I don't think that's the way it works. Yeah, I think it is. No, that's accurate. I don't think it is. That's what happens. I don't think it does. All cats go to heaven. It's not the way it works. Are you calling me a liar? So do you want to go to church with me? Oh yeah, there's always a right way and the wrong way. All cats go to heaven? Hmm. We've been looking here at the last few weeks at the different ways that God speaks to his children, how God speaks to us. In the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in various ways. We've looked at some of those. But in these last days, he's spoken to us by his son. So what we've seen is that most often God will speak through his word. Read until you hear something. Read until you hear something. That might be two verses. And if God speaks in that second verse, stop for a moment. What do you say, Lord? I hear you speaking to me. Meditate upon that word. See what he's trying to say to you. God speaks through prayer. An important part of the prayer is for you and I to listen. What is God trying to say to me? I have plenty to say to God, but what is God trying to say to me? God will preach through preaching and, and your, your testimonies. And each week, these last few weeks, people come to me after the service and share stories. It's your testimony. And when God writes a story, it's a great story. Amen. And he's the author of your life, so he's writing a great story. Look at somebody this morning and say, God is writing a great story. And he's doing that in your life, and I praise God for that. He, he speaks through dreams. I had, I had a number of awesome dreams this week. One, one morning, I woke up, and I had seen rainbows like I had never seen rainbows before. I had seen nine rainbows over here, kind of intermixed. I saw a rainbow that was a straight line as far as the eye could see. And then I saw seven parallel rainbows over here. And I woke up and I told Pam the story. And she said, well, God has lots of promises for us. And those rainbows remind us of the promises of God. God speaks to his Holy Spirit. His spirit speaks to my spirit. When you get that gut feeling, you need to do something or help somebody or say something to someone, that is his spirit inaudibly speaking to your spirit and say, 
this needs to be done. But God does speak audibly. And some of you have heard God's voice audibly. And God also speaks through songs. How often people will come forward during a song because the song is speaking to their soul. It's hitting a chord within their soul. So how do I know? How do I know that it's God speaking or the enemy speaking to me right there on my shoulder trying to get me to go the other direction or that it's my own thinking, my own desires that are at work here. And what I would share with you this morning is that God is speaking loud and clear. It's not a matter of you not hearing from God often. It's a matter of us ignoring what God is saying to us. Because when God speaks, number one, it's going to be compelling. He will compel you to do something. It will become almost an irresistible force within you. If I'm going to be obedient to God's will in my life, then I'm going to have to do this. God has spoken loud and clear. God will speak clearly. He's not a God of confusion. He's a God of clarity. You will know exactly what he's saying. And God will be consistent. He will always be consistent with what is written in here. This is our plumb line. If someone is telling me something that is not in line with the word of God, then I know that it's not coming from God. It's their voice speaking to me and not his voice speaking to me. So it's important to know God's word. Amen? Amen. Compelling. It will be an irresistible voice. Jonah, God came to him and God said, I want you to go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for its wickedness had come up before me. Very clear, very compelling. This is what I want you to do. What did Jonah do? Not what I want to hear. That's not what I want to hear. I'm leaving town. Gets on a boat. Did God give up on him? Did God give up on the people of Nineveh? No. God was compelling. A storm comes up on the sea. Jonah says, it's all about me. They throw him into the sea, and he ends up in the belly of a big fish. Now he has some time not only to pray, but to listen to God again, who's compelling him to go to Nineveh. When God speaks, it's going to be like an irresistible compelling in your life to do what it is he is asking you to do. Jesus said that uh, he would bring his own sheep. He goes before them and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. It's like if you were in a dark room and your children or grandchildren were on the other side of the dark room and you wanted to get them from that side of the dark room to your side of the dark room, but there are other people in the room. Those people might say, come on over here, Ryder. Come on over here, Ryder. But Ryder's not going to listen. He's not going to listen if he doesn't know the voice. But when he hears Pappy, or he hears his dad, or mom, or his Mimi, or his nanny, when he hears them, when he hears that voice, it's a voice he knows. And even though it's dark, he knows that he can follow that voice right to where that person is. If we had the good fortune of going to Israel, even today you would see uh, flocks of sheep that were together. And all these sheep are intermixed. And you've got a number of shepherds standing around there. And they're chatting, probably on their cell phones these days with their staffs and all. And when it's time to go, one of those shepherds will step aside and he'll just give his call with his voice. Now all these sheep are mixed up. His sheep among all the other sheep. But the minute they hear his voice, you will watch in amazement as those sheep work their way through all the other sheep to get to him. If somebody else calls, they just keep on eating. But when they hear the shepherd call, they lift their heads up and they begin to follow. They know that it's time to go. It's a compelling voice and they follow that voice because they know it. And as we read God's word, we get to know and recognize his voice even more. We have a member in our congregation who was driving home after work two and a half years ago, he said. It was raining that night. And as he was on his way home through Elkton, he said, a voice began to say to me, you need to go to church and pray. Now, he had a long day at work. He was on his way home for supper. And the voice was saying he needed to turn around and go to church and pray. So he kept driving and the voice kept saying, you need to turn around, you need to go to church, and you need to pray. And when he got to his exit, 
He finally did the U-turn. He turned around because the voice won't stop. God has a compelling, clear voice. He turned around. He came to church. It's raining. He gets out of his car. He kneels in front of the three white crosses that are on the outside of this wall right here. And he begins to pray. He doesn't know what he's supposed to be praying about. He just knows he's supposed to pray. Every now and then I will get that sense. Oh, you need to pray. Something's going on out there. There's a spiritual war going on somewhere. You need to stop what you're doing and you need to pray. And so I will pray till that feeling goes away, till I have peace. And Lord, I don't know who or what I'm praying for, but there's a battle going on out there and you want prayer going up. You know who they are. You know what the need is and you will meet it. You have that kind of wisdom. And when I get the peace, then I'm able to stop praying about that matter. And so he's out here kneeling with rain coming down on him in front of those three crosses praying. A gray van, he said, came around the church and they're kind of looking like, why is that guy out in the rain kneeling before those three crosses? Because God's voice was compelling that day him to come to church and pray. And whatever he prayed about, I'm sure there was a victory somewhere. But he did say this. He said, my life has not been the same since then. That day changed my life. And when we obey God, it will always bring a change in our life. Because to obey Him is to love Him. So let me ask you this today. Will the voice that you're hearing lead you closer to God or further from God? Jonah heard the voice and he tried to run. But God was compelling him to go. And God got him where he wanted him to go, even though he didn't like what he was hearing. God speaks loud and clear. God speaks with clarity. He's not a God of confusion. He's a God of light. Whenever Jesus was baptized, he came up out of the water. And the Bible says the Spirit came down as a dove. And the heavens opened up and God spoke. He spoke loud and clear. He said, this is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Now, how does Matthew know that? Matthew wasn't a disciple yet. Jesus was baptized before Matthew ever became a disciple. But when you read the Gospel of Matthew, he includes the story in his book. How did he know it? Because somebody was there. Somebody saw the heavens open. Somebody saw the Spirit come down. And somebody heard the voice loud and clear. This is my son whom I love. With him I'm well pleased. And somebody said, Matthew, you need to include that in your book. And Matthew said, well, if it was that loud, that clear, then I'm going to include that in my book. Because when we obey God, it's our way of saying, I love you. When Jesus was baptized, it wasn't for any sin. It was out of obedience. And any time I do anything out of obedience, it's my way of saying, God, I love you. On Easter Sunday right now, we have five people planning on being baptized. Right back here. Five people. And we're going to ask. Is there anyone else who's feeling compelled, who fear, hears the clear voice of God saying, come, follow me, I'll make you fishers of men. Anybody else hearing that voice today, we want you to step forward and get your name written down in the Lamb's Book of Life as well. And you know what? God may have been already speaking that loud and clear to you, but we don't always want to hear what he's saying. The question is, will you listen today? There's a pastor that I read regularly, and he shared a story of a time he had to spend in prayer because he was planning a mission trip to Costa Rica. And he had been there on numerous occasions. They had built a mission there. He loved going there. He loved the people there. He loved the experience there. So he was planning another trip there, and all of a sudden he got that feeling inside. Feeling of confusion. Feeling of doubt. Maybe I shouldn't go on this trip. Should I? Shouldn't I? And so he decided, before he made a decision, he was going to make sure he had a clear word from God. So he started to pray. He prayed for an hour, and the feeling didn't go away. He prayed for two hours, the feeling didn't go away. He prayed five hours, that feeling was still there. He wasn't getting the clarity. He wasn't hearing the loud, clear voice of God on what to do. He prayed for 17 hours. Have you even thought about praying for 17 hours? It was that important. It was that important to him. Because God was speaking and he wanted to make sure he was hearing God's voice and not his. And his voice was saying go and God's voice was saying no. 
after 17 hours of prayer, he came to realize God did not want him to go on this trip. And he found peace. You pray till you find peace. He found peace. The airplane that flew out of Mexico City that he would have been on crashed that day and everyone in the plane died. Now, did God speak to the other people on that plane? I don't know. That's not my point today. My point is this man heard God's voice calling and he had to wait and pray long enough until he knew that it was the loud, clear voice of God speaking and not his own desires to do something that he so wanted to do. God is a God who speaks loud and clear. He is not a God of confusion. It's up to you and I to spend enough time to make sure we're clearly hearing his voice. And finally, consistent. Consistent. I read a story this week about a pastor who said, and finally, and then he preached for 45 more minutes. Uh, I'm not doing that today. You're never supposed to use that word, finally. And now, the word consistent. God will be consistent with his voice. Your word is a lamp to my feet, a light to my path. This has been the pioneer Bible verse for years. We want our young people to know that this word will light up your life. It will light up your path. It will light your way. It will help direct you so you don't stumble and fall as you watch others around you stumbling and falling. Consistent. God will be consistent in his voice with what we find here. Jesus was fasting and praying 40 days in the wilderness. The devil comes along and he says, turn these stones into bread. Did Jesus have the power to turn those stones into bread? He had the power to turn those stones into bread, but he wasn't there to turn stones into bread. He was there to pray. And what the devil was trying to do was to disrupt his fast, disrupt his fast, disrupt his prayer to keep him from hearing God's voice and start listening to his voice. And Jesus recognized immediately that what the devil was saying wasn't consistent with God's word. And so Jesus said, wait, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but every word that comes from the mouth of God. I need to hear from him before I ever think about turning stones into bread. I recognize your voice is not being consistent with what we find in the Word, so I'm not going to listen to what you have to say. I will not break my fast. I will not break my prayer. That's the reason the Father has me out here. As I was walking on the prayer path this week, a thought came to mind or a whisper came to my soul. Sometimes they're hard to differentiate. Was it a thought from reading the Word or was it a whisper of the Spirit in my soul? And as I prayed for you on the prayer path this week, a thought came to my mind. God said, it's not that people can't hear me. It's more that they don't want to hear what I have to say. He's been telling you for some time. And you've been saying, that's not what I want to hear. That's not what I want to hear. Like Jonah, I would just rather run from that than run to that. Whoa, I'll just stop and think about that. In Jeremiah chapter 27, early in the reign of Zedekiah, son of Josiah, king of Judah, this word came to Jeremiah from the Lord. This is what the Lord said to me. Make a yoke out of straps and crossbars and put it on your neck. Then send word to the kings of Edom, of Moab, of Ammon, of Tyre, and Sidon, through the envoys who have come to Jerusalem, to Zedekiah, king of Judah. So, he puts this wooden yoke on his neck and starts to walk around. They call him a prophet of doom. That yoke meant that Nebuchadnezzar, who had already carried many other people off to Babylon, was going to continue to carry their people off to Babylon. That those people were going to spend a number of years in exile out of their own land. That's not what people wanted to hear. They abused Jeremiah the prophet. They'd throw him into a pit. They would try to get rid of this guy on regular. They didn't want to hear what he had to say. They didn't want to think that God would punish them for their wrongdoing, for worshiping other gods. But they waited until somebody came along. His name was Hananiah. Hananiah comes along and he says, This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. 
I will break the yoke of the king of Babylon. Within two years, I will bring back to this place all the articles of the Lord's house that Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, removed from here and took to Babylon. This is what God says. And everybody cheered. That's what we want to hear. God's going to put his fist down. He's going to squish that little king over there. He's going to bring all of our people back and we're going to reign. And they applauded Hananiah. They were happy to hear him. Finally, somebody with some sense. Jeremiah was standing there. Jeremiah said, amen. Amen. I pray that's what happens. But I want you to understand something. From times past, all the prophets have preached doom and destruction is going to come if we don't repent, if we continue to live in this sin. But now you come along and you preach peace. And here's the danger in that. If peace doesn't come, then we know what you say isn't true. So Hananiah walks over to Jeremiah. He takes the wooden yoke off his neck and he breaks it over his knee. And this is the way God's going to break the yoke of King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. And God speaks through Jeremiah and he says to Hananiah, you shouldn't have done that. You shouldn't have done that. You shouldn't have told my people this when that's not my voice. And within two months, Hananiah had died. And for the next 70 years, not two, the next 70 years, the Israelites would spend in exile in Babylon. And then, then, after 70 years of hearing what they didn't want to hear, Jeremiah tells them this is what will happen after those 70 years. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not harm you. Plans to bring you hope in the future. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. You see, that wonderful verse that we love so much came after a time of discipline. A time of God working through his people to help them turn back to him. And it took 70 years for that promise to come true. But what a promise. Whose voice are you listening to today? Is God telling you something you really don't want to hear? John Ortberg says, My life is the ballot I cast for God or against God. My life and how I live it and who I listen to is the ballot I cast for God or against God. One person I read this week said this, and I can't get this out of my mind. There are some atheists who live their lives as though they're believers. And there are some believers who live their lives as though they're atheists. Is he talking about those people who hear the voice of God but don't want to hear what God is saying? I had a dream last night. And in my dream, a member of our church was driving a bus. She comes to our early service. It was my school bus. I was back in high school. And we were on my school bus. Not in my school bus. We were on the roof of my school bus, going to school. Just hanging on, having a good old time. Now, one of my friends, he decides he's going to swing down and dangle over the side and just hold on to that little ledge on the roof. And I said, you need to get back up here before the school bus driver sees you at that not like she had a problem with us up there on the roof, just a problem with us dangling on the side of the roof. So he gets up there just in time as she stops and she turns around and she looks at all of us and we're all on the roof of the bus and she said, this riding on the roof of the bus has got to come to an end. <laughs> yeah, good idea. <laughs> good idea. And this idea, this, this, that I can hear God's voice but not want to listen to what he's saying has got to come to an end. The Bible says that we are in the last days, that the end is near, that Jesus is coming, that 
and all this pain and all this sorrow and all this death and all this misery that we see, that he is the answer to all the problems that the world sees and will continue to see until he comes back, and that that time is very close. And until that time comes, our mission is to use the gifts that we've been given, and I'm going to welcome the worship team up here, to use the gifts that we've been given to build up the kingdom, to strengthen the believers here, and to encourage one another. And some of you, unlike me, have been given the gift of music. You might be able to sing. I can sing, just not well. But some of you have been sitting out there for some time now, and you're listening to the praise team singing, and you're thinking, boy, I'd like to do that someday. And God's saying, that someday's here. That someday's now. The end is so close. Why are you waiting to use the gift I've given to you to bless this congregation? Because so often it's in song that people hear a voice from God encouraging them in their journey. Some of you have instruments at home. And you can play them. And you can play them pretty well. I can play the radio, all right? It's as far as I can go. That's me. So today I'm talking to those who have been given a gift of music. And as we stand, as we listen to this last song, I just, I want you to come up to the front pew and just stand here in the front pew. And when this service is over, uh, Randy and David, who are team leaders of our worship team, says, come. Come and use the gifts that you've been given. We enjoy being up here praising the Lord. But we recognize there are others with that gift who need to do it too. And you can't keep running like Jonah. God's compelling you to do this. The time is short. I want you standing before God and say, you know, you gave me this great gift, but I, I chose not to listen to what you were telling me. I didn't really like it. And they're saying, you don't have to play for the next 10 years. You can help out for the next six months. They'll work with you with the time and the talent that you have. But you've got talents, and we want to be blessed by it. Just like those who have the gift of service, those who have the gift of teaching, those who have blessed you in so many ways in this congregation, this is your opportunity. So I want you to stand. I want you to be compelled. I want you to hear that voice loud and clear. I want you to be consistent today with your faith. I don't want you looking like an atheist. I want you looking like a person who loves Jesus Christ. And people who love Jesus Christ are obedient to his call. And this, this morning, is a specific call to those of you who have some ability in the area of singing and playing music. May God compel you to come up here and talk to Randy and David after the service today and say, I've heard the call. I've heard the call.
and together we sing. Everyone sing. Yeah. Holy is the Lord. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. At the early service, we had about three people who came forward. They have about a fourth as many people as we have here at this service. So that leads me to believe that there's a dozen people right here this morning who are really wrestling with the Lord. All right. You know who's going to get pinned here, don't you? In this wrestling match, you really think you can beat him? Why do you want to try and beat him? We're asking you to cast your vote today for a brighter, clearer, even more wonderful future here at Mount Olive. So we welcome those of you with this gift. Be a part of this team. Come up here this morning before you leave. Talk to Randy and David. Get your feet wet. I know you're out there. Gail? My morning scripture that pops up on my phone uh, goes right along with this. It talks about trust. Uh, as we trust in him, what he'll do for us. So as that tugging's on your heart, uh, let those feet be loose and trust in him and step forward. Let's pray. And this is the scripture from Romans 15, 13. It's a blessing. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>